Holy Father, we know that you look to the one who is humble and contrite and trembles at your word. And so we pray this evening, would you give us great humility as we listen to your word read and preached. Give us soft, teachable hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 1. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. How were you inferior to the other churches? except that I was never a burden to you. Forgive me this wrong. Thanks so much, Mark. And keep open 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, if you've got one of those red church Bibles in front of you, I think it will help you and me as well. What um, I wonder is your biggest weakness. What you say? I, I, I'm sorry if that brings back really bad memories of a very recent job interview or something like that. Lots of people have moved to Cambridge recently and um, started new jobs or whatever, or perhaps you're just graduating and you're about to leave Cambridge or something like that. Um, I mean it seriously, though. What is it that makes you feel weak and helpless? It might be a particular situation or circumstance that you're currently facing, something that you just really can't change and have no control over. It might be a real long-term health condition. It might be something to do with your mental health. It could be something very hidden that really not very many people know about at all and that you don't really share with anybody. It could be something that everyone knows about and is kind of embarrassing and a bit shameful and, and you kind of wish it wasn't there. It might be something to do with sexuality or gender. It could be any number of things. I think British culture hates admitting weakness. If you're not from the UK, I wonder whether it's like that at your, in your home too. I was reading actually online a few different kind of Bits of advice, something like Forbes magazine or Business Insider or whatever, advice about how to talk about your weaknesses in job interviews and how to talk about a weakness in a job interview in a way that actually makes it come across like a strength. Oh, I care far too much about what people think. I work way too hard, like all those kind of things. Apparently, interviewers actually see through that kind of stuff. But even though we don't really like admitting weakness and talking about things that make us weak, even though maybe... Uh, we might be getting a bit better at it, I think, as a culture. But even if that is the case, have you noticed that when people do talk about being weak or going through hard things or speak up about something that's hard, we frame it in terms of strength. 
oh, they're really strong. As if, oh, isn't it great that they've got themselves together enough to talk about how they've been weak in the past, but now they're doing fine. We hate talking about weakness, but each of us know, I think, deep down, that when we kind of let down that mask, the successful Cambridge mask, or the kind of grinning, happy, Christian all the time mask, there are things in our lives that make us feel deeply weak. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, has a a radically different way of thinking about weakness. Look at verse 10. He says, For Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. It's a pretty comprehensive list of calamities. But he says that he's not just able to cope with them or to put up with them, but to actually, and this is so strong, isn't it, to actually delight in weakness. How is it that he can say this? Really, all I'm going to say this evening is kind of summed up in one point. It's a bit of a one-point sermon. Paul knows that the weaker he is, the stronger God shows himself to be. The weaker he is, the stronger God shows himself to be. That is true in Christian ministry. That's kind of Paul's primary context, as we'll see. And it's true, too, in the whole of the Christian life. Look at verse 9, and notice the kind of linking word. He's able to boast all the more gladly about his weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on him. The weaker he knows that he is, the stronger God shows himself to be. And as Sarah alluded to earlier, it's actually been kind of one of the main line tunes in the book of Corinthians all the way through. So in chapter one, you may remember, he talked about the kind of troubles that he and his companions experienced in Asia, great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. We despaired of life. We felt we'd reached the sentence of death. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9. But Again, the linking word, this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. And it's the same in that verse that Sarah referenced earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Our ministry looks weak from the outside, so that to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The weaker we know that we are, the stronger God shows himself to be. And the Christians in Corinth, in this kind of messy church that he's writing to, have been wooed by some false teachers, or he calls them kind of sarcastically in verse 11, super apostles, who get this dynamic completely upside down. Their message is the opposite. God's power, they say, is made perfect in power, in wealth, in impressive meetings and clever speakers and all the rest. And they're dragging the Corinthians away from Jesus. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, is the kind of climax of a section where Paul is desperately trying to wean the Corinthians off this destructive way of living and thinking. He's been reluctant to speak like it. He's talking as a fool, verse 11. But he knows he has to do something because he wants them to come back to the crucified Savior. And so what he's been doing is actually kind of neat. Instead of competing on their terms, they think they're impressive, well, I can be just as impressive, come back to me. He changes the name of the game. Remember verse 30 of chapter 11 from last week. If I must boast, he's pretty reluctant to boast. If I must boast, though, I'll bust boast of the things that show my weakness. And that's what he's been doing the whole way through. So last week, we had the kind of catalog of failures. He's been shipwrecked a bunch of times. He's been beaten and imprisoned. He's sometimes gone hungry without food because he hasn't got enough money. The works. Paul comes across as a failure. And here's the kind of climax of his boasting in weakness. Chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting. They forced him to it. Although there's nothing to be gained, I'll go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. We get one more insight into who these sort of super apostles are in this verse. They seem to be claiming some kind of superiority in terms of their experiences of like spiritual life or whatever. I don't know if you've ever heard someone speak like this. The Lord spoke to me in a vision this morning and this is what you must do. It can be a bit of a power play, can't it? Makes you feel pretty good about yourself and it can be quite coercive to others. Well, Paul says, okay, let's move on to visions 
and revelations. I've got my own to share. I know a man in Christ, verse 2, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. It's kind of weird. He's talking about himself in the third person. I think by six and seven, you kind of get it. It's kind of obvious that he's talking about himself. By doing it in the third person, it's almost like he's, he's distancing himself from the experience. He's, he doesn't want to boast about it. This isn't Paul, the apostle of Jesus, talking about the special visions that he gets from God. This is just an ordinary Christian, a man in Christ, and he's kind of embarrassed to talk about it. Do you notice, too, how he's kind of deliberately vague about what actually happened in this vision? It's some kind of intimate experience of God. You get that in the language of paradise or or third heaven, which is a kind of way of talking about the highest heaven in Jewish thought. But was it a dream? Was it a physical experience? He doesn't really know. What did he see? Well, he doesn't say. He's unable to say, verse 4. He doesn't want us to get bogged down in the details of this kind of spiritual experience. It's like he's almost saying, these guys want to talk about that kind of stuff. Well, I didn't really want to, to be honest. I'm backed into a corner. I have actually seen stuff, but I don't really want to focus on that. There's something else I want to say. Just in passing, he's so different from from me, and I, I guess many of us here. If I ever had a spiritual experience like that, I mean, can you imagine, right, being transported to the very throne room of God with a little kind of personal tour of heaven or something like that? I would not stop talking about that kind of thing. I set up a a YouTube channel, picking out every single detail and aim for the thousands and millions of subscribers. I'd get in touch with a Christian publisher and sign a book deal. I'd bring it up in literally every single conversation that I had and every single talk that I ever gave. But Paul says, don't evaluate my ministry based on whether or not I've had some vision. Do it instead, verse 6, on what I do and say. I'm refraining from speaking about all this stuff so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do and say. I love how kind of down-to-earth and normal that way of speaking about his ministry is. This is the surefire test of whether something's an authentic Christian church or not, as whether whether someone really represents Jesus. Just as a side, if, you're, if you are moving to a new city this summer looking for a new church or whatever, apply this simple test as you search for a church. Does what they preach line up with Scripture? Are they faithfully representing Jesus? And does what they do line up with what they preach? So much of the bad press that Christians get is when those two things are not quite right. It's not the only way to choose and think about a church. You might want to talk about it with someone else, but it's certainly where to start. But why does he mention this like, vision that he's had after all? Like, is it kind of like a, a backhanded, kind of humble brat? Like, I actually do happen to have these spiritual experiences or not? Well, I think actually the reason he talks about it is because of what comes afterwards. Look at verse 7, which I think actually kind of reads better as one sentence in the original. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, because of these, for this reason, in order to keep me from becoming conceited or proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. From the highs of this amazing vision that Paul has, he describes how he was brought back to earth with a bit of a bump. The Lord gave him a thorn. Now, no one is really sure exactly what he's talking about here. I read one um, book this week that said it's one of the most debated passages in the whole of the New Testament. It could be that he, he's describing something negative, clearly, and it could be the opposition that he faces as he travels around the world, uh, around the Mediterranean, speaking about Jesus. It could be that sense that he had of being just very, very guilty about his role in the persecution of Christians before he became a Christian. Do you remember he stood to the side as the first Christian martyr was stoned to death. And I'm sure that would have haunted him throughout the rest of his life. It could be some kind of physical illness or maybe a psychological illness. People think it's to do with blindness or whatever. I'm not sure. Maybe that's the most likely thing. I don't know. But two things are clear, even if it's not exactly clear what he's referring to. It's a very painful experience. And in God's kindness, it has a purpose, an ultimate purpose. 
You get the sense of pain from the word itself, a thorn or a spiky thing, a splinter. Have you ever had a splinter that just doesn't kind of get out? It's, it's horrible. I, once, um, I remember once when I was about 20, I think, I stepped barefoot on a nail that was sticking up like this, and it went right. I, I can see you guys wincing. Thanks very much. It, it went right. It absolutely horrible. It really, really, really hurt. And I remember just for weeks afterwards, it changes the whole way that you walk. You've got this constant thing, kind of twisting around, trying not to put any pressure on it. It's horrible. Well, Paul's thorn is even worse than that because it's also humiliating. Verse, um, what verse is it? I think it's verse 8. Sorry, verse 9. To torment me. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. That word is the same word, harass, or beat round the face, or punch, which is used to describe what Jesus experiences as he's put on the cross. For 14 years, Paul has to deal with this painful experience, whatever it is. In fact, it's so painful that he pleads with the Lord for it to be removed, verse 8, three times. It's painful, and yet it has a purpose. The Lord uses this suffering that Paul experiences for good. There's a kind of mystery going on in verse 7. Just have a look down there and try and work out who does the thorn come from it's a bit confusing isn't it it says it was given and it's also a messenger from satan this is if you like the kind of deep end of the spiritual swimming pool although it comes from satan i think when he says it's given paul is referring to something that god himself has given although the thorn in and of itself is not a good thing he doesn't kind of delight masochistically in this this thing that he has to experience yet even so, God uses this for good. He uses it to keep him humble, to keep him dependent on Christ. And this, this is classic God, isn't it? Just think of Joseph. Remember Joseph and the, and, and the kind of technical dream coat and all his brothers who send him away to slavery in Egypt? At the end of his life, Joseph is able to look back on that and say, you guys intended to harm me, but God intended it for good for the saving of many lives. Think of Jesus on the cross, murdered through unfair mob justice and a corrupt legal system, but God intended it as a sacrifice for all who believe. Paul is so convinced that God is at work through this particular experience of suffering that he can say that it is a gift of God. Because he knows that it is only through weakness, only through being brought low by this experience, that he's learned the greatest lesson there is to learn. Look at verse 9. Well, let's, let's take it from verse 8. He pleads with the Lord. Three times I plead with the Lord to take away this thorn. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It is beautiful, this verse. If you didn't know it before, you must learn it and remember it and think about it. Before, Paul saw two options. Okay, There's the one option, which is life with the thorn, which is just going to be awful forever. The other option is life without the thorn. So obviously, he prays to God that he'd remove this thorn. He pleads for relief. But God says, actually, look, there's a third way here. I keep you going. The stronger he, the weaker we see, show ourselves to be, we know that we are, the stronger he shows himself to be. Paul's prayer for relief actually is answered. It's kind of funny, isn't it? But just not in the way that he expects. God's answer is to give more grace. Grace is kind of shorthand, I think, here for God's gracious presence with him. The way he sustained and empowered, and calmed, and supported, and comforted, and emboldened, and satisfied in him. My grace is sufficient for you means I am sufficient for you. Jesus is enough. And I think that it's when we come to the end of our tether, when we finally give up and collapse helpless into his arms, that we really experience just how much he gives. If we claim to be self-sufficient, then we'll, we won't seek him and we won't experience him. But if we recognize our weakness, 
his power will be both sought by us and granted. One writer puts it like this. In our lowness, in our incapacities, naturally we're tended to flee away from those things, but it's exactly in those things where God loves to dwell. And that, by the way, is the whole dynamic of the gospel, isn't it? It shouldn't surprise us that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, because when it comes to the Christian life, we begin by offering absolutely nothing. We just said that to one another as we confessed our sins corporally. Everybody in this room who said the words on the screen just admitted that we bring absolutely nothing when we come to God. We're completely weak, inadequate, full of sin. We deserve nothing, but he extends his mercy. This is the very dynamic of the gospel. Weakness is the way of the Christian life. I actually think it's kind of good that we don't get loads of detail about what Paul's thorn is. It's partly very deliberate. On the one hand, it doesn't really matter. He doesn't want to focus on himself because he knows that, you know, as if he focuses on himself, even in the weakness stuff, He's deflecting from Jesus, and he, he longs for the Corinthians to come back to, to Jesus. Strengths make us look good. Weaknesses make him look good. Paul wants to get out of the way and let us see him. But I think the kind of vagueness, the fact that we don't know what this thorn is, is also really applicable to many of us. All of us can relate in some way or another to what Paul's talking about. And if you can't yet, if life is just going great for you, well, good for you. But this is a passage to store away for those hardest moments in life. When the phone rings and somebody says, I'm really sorry, this isn't good news. I am in uh, St. Andrew Great, mainly work with undergraduate students who are all away for the holidays at the moment. Um, but... I've been thinking about this with, um, with one particular student. I hope he won't mind me mentioning this. But um, he, he's, in the last year or so, had to completely step back from, um, from studying. He's had a, a long-term chronic health condition that he just doesn't understand and that the doctors have really struggled to diagnose. Um, and I think he's learned to see, I think, the kind of strength that comes from weakness. And it's been really helpful for him, and I think for some of the student community as well, as, as we've kind of walked through this with him, um, to learn the game-changing nature of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We prayed desperately that the Lord would fix whatever's wrong, remove the pain, help the doctors to get a diagnosis or whatever. And the Lord's answered some of those prayers. But actually, what he's come to know, and he says it and shares it with me, and, and with others, is the reality of verse 9, that God's grace is sufficient. It's as he's known the struggle and the weakness that he's come to know more of Jesus Christ. In that kind of situation, the kind of the power and the strength message of the super apostles can actually be kind of dangerous. It's all about life and wealth and health now. And if you don't get it, well, then there's clearly something wrong with you. And I'm not sure necessarily that we'd fall for that kind of thing, or many of us would fall for that kind of thing um, here. But our hearts tend to lean that way, don't they? We presume that when weakness comes, it's because something's gone wrong. Everybody has a right to a kind of pain-free, comfortable life, a life that enables us to discover and display and, dis and deploy all the strengths that are latent in us. And when weakness comes, we get completely thrown off track. I think you see that kind of attitude in, in our prayers, sometimes the way that we pray for one another. I think, I think you see it in the way that we're honest or perhaps not so honest with one another. We hate to admit weakness, don't we? Because it feels like a failure in front of others. I see it in myself in the way that I cope with disappointment or when things don't go quite so well. Anger or frustration when life hasn't turned out the way that we want it to. But the reality check from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is that a life of strength and power and health and wealth is not the life to which we are called. In this world, Jesus says, you'll have trouble. To live this side of the new creation is to experience life in a broken world. To follow Jesus is to follow a man who walked the path of weakness. 
Verse 9 again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In this world you will have trouble, Jesus says, but I have overcome the world. It's not wrong to pray for circumstances to change. God can work in that mountaintop way or even here. But at the end of the day, if his answer is to give more grace, to bring us closer to him in the experience of weakness and suffering, according to Paul, that's actually better. It's better because we learn more of him and his wonder and grace. That's why I think at the end, he can delight in weakness, verse 10, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, because he knows this paradox is true. When he is weak, then he is strong in Jesus Christ. As we close, I wonder what it would look like to kind of embody that attitude that Paul has. How it would transform our hopes and expectations for ourselves, our conversations with each other, our prayers for the summer months. What would it look like to a watching world? Wow, those guys, they don't need to fake it. They're, they struggle, sure. But they can say, it's well with my soul. Even when things go completely upside down, they've got something I want. What would it look like to delight in weakness as Paul does? Let me pray as we close. Our Father, you know each individual circumstance and situation. You know what we face and how this we kind of read and hear this sort of passage. We ask in your kindness that you continually teach us that when we are weak, that is when you show yourself to be strong. In Jesus' name, amen.